Ave Maria Prisma, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. On uh, the Vigil Ascension this past Wednesday, the epistle was taken from St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians. In, in, chapters, uh, in chapter 4, in verses 8 and 9, we read of Christ our Lord that, quote, Ascending on high, he led captivity captive. He gave gifts to men. Now that he ascended, what is it? But because he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth. So that's the scripture. Ascending on high, he led captivity captive. He gave gifts to men. Now that he ascended, what is it? Because he descended first into the lower parts of the earth. Now there's two interesting things there. There's more than two, but there's two interesting points we'll ponder. First, what our Lord's soul did immediately after he died. It descended to the lower parts of the earth. And then what he did uh, 40 days after his soul was reunited with his body, the ascension. We've gone over this a gazillion times every time we say the creed, but today we'll take a little closer look at each of those. Okay, so let's get started. On Good Friday, when our Lord died, when God the Son died, When God the Son's soul was separated from his body, because that's what death means, the soul separates from the body, his soul descended. Just pause for a moment and ask ourselves, okay, this is God the Son we're talking about. We're talking about the soul of Jesus, the soul of God the Son. Why would his soul descend when it left his body? Why did it descend into the underworld? Why would it descend, as we say in the Creed, into hell? Why why wouldn't his soul immediately ascend into heaven? We're talking about the soul of God the Son here. Okay. In the first place, since the sin of Adam, the original sin, heaven had been closed to man. There were angels in heaven, but no men. There were no souls of men in heaven at all. So at that point in time, as soon as a man died... His soul descended to hell, but not necessarily to the same location. What does that mean? It descended to hell, but not necessarily the same location. What is that supposed to mean? Hell is hell, isn't it? Yes and no. In the modern understanding of the world, which is when we say hell, it's taken for Gehenna, the fiery prison of the damned and the demons. But, no, because in the olden days, that word had a broader meaning. That's why we use it in the creed like that. It applied to not not just what we call now, now hell or Gehenna, but it also applied to the whole underworld. So we'll pause right there and have a geography lesson about the underworld, and then we'll be able to see where our Lord's soul descended to. In his book on purgatory, the great bishop and doctor of the church, St. Robert Bellarmine, states, quote, The common teaching that scholastic theologians is that within the earth there are four inner recesses, one for the damned, another for those purged of sins, a third for those infants who have died without receiving baptism, and a fourth, which is now empty, but once held those just men who died before the passion of Christ. Close quote. The holy doctor explains that the damned souls are burning in the very center of the earth. And of course, this is Gehenna, which nowadays we call hell. St. Robert explains that the next level above Gehenna, that inner place of the damned, is purgatory. They're getting purified by the same fires that torment the damned. And then above purgatory, as we approach the fringe of hell, and the Latin word for fringe, uh, limbo. limbo. Limbo comes from the Latin word limbus. It means the edge, or fringe, or border, which surrounds anything. Above purgatory is the limbo of the children, where the fire does not reach. And right above that is the limbo of the fathers. So, the underworld has levels. Deepest is Gehenna, what we commonly call hell now. Then purgatory, those are the two sections that have the heating system. Then above that, you have limbo of the infants and limbo of the fathers. That's the structure of the underworld. Let's take a closer look at each of those levels. Everyone here is familiar with Gehenna, or hell. Since the beginning of the world, this has been the destination of the souls of men who die with even one unforgiven mortal sin. They die with one unforgiven mortal sin in the con- conscious, they go to Gehenna. In our days, there are certain people, priests, for example, like men, men like Hans Urs von Balthasar, or uh, the immensely popular, best-selling author of Bishop Robert Barron, who dare to suggest that besides the demons, no one is in hell, that the church has never, ever taught that anyone actually goes to hell, that we can actually dare to hope 
that all men are saved. But this idea that all men are saved is itself a doctrine of the devil. In August 1458, Pope Pius II condemned the statement, and I quote, all Christians are to be saved, close quote. That's condemned. It is condemned to say that all Christians are to be saved. If that's condemned, that means that the contrary must be true. If all Christians are to be saved is false, then some Christians are not saved, which is to say some Christians are damned. It's true. And we'll just cite one scripture on these lines, our Lord's words himself. Luke chapter 13 and verses 23 and 24, quote, And a certain man said to him, Lord, are they few that are saved? But he said to them, Strive to enter by the narrow gate. For many, I say to you, shall seek to enter and shall not be able. Many shall seek to enter and will not be able, means that many will not be saved. We have God's word on it. And that shouldn't really surprise us. As the great doctor of the church, St. John Chrysostom, points out, most Christians are walking on the road to hell throughout their life. Why should anyone be surprised that the greater number goes to hell? To arrive at a destination, we have to take the road that leads there. Next level up, purgatory. Purgatory is a defined dogma of the faith. It's defined by the Second Council of Lyon, the Council of Florence, and the Council of Trent. Anybody that denies the existence of purgatory is a heretic. What is purgatory? Purgatory is easy to understand. It's like summer school for heaven. You didn't flunk, but you didn't quite pass either. It's both a place as well as a state of expiation. Expiation is a $3 word which just means they're making amends. So purgatory is a place and a state where souls make amends. The souls in purgatory died in the state of grace. So they're all saved. But as St. Paul puts it, they're saved as through fire. They cannot yet enter heaven yet because they have to make amends. Well, if their sins are forgiven, then what does it mean that they're going to get punished? What is this about amends? It doesn't make sense. Actually, it's a very easy concept to understand. The virtue of justice consists in rendering unto someone what is his due. Justice means you pay what you owe. So if we steal something, justice means we have to return it. We have to make restitution in order to rebalance the scales of justice. That's what restitution means. Now when we sin, not only have we not rendered unto God what we owe him, which is absolute obedience, we have tipped the scales of justice. We have to do two things to get those scales tipped back. We have to make reparation and repent. Or actually, in the opposite order. Repent, make reparation. Okay? If we don't repent before we die and we're guilty of mortal sin, we'll go to hell. We're down. But if we do repent before we die, but we haven't made restitution yet for that sin, that's purgatory. Okay, so the Council of Florence said the poor souls suffer. What does that mean? What kind of sufferings are they going through? There are two pains in purgatory. The delay of the beatific vision and the pain of sense. The delay of the beatific vision is actually the chief pain in purgatory. The souls truly love God with all, above all things. On the one hand... They're full of joy because they have this hope of soon being delivered from this state. But on the other hand, they're in agony from not being able to see God yet, who they want to see so much and whom they love so deeply. That's real suffering. According to St. Augustine, St. Isidore, St. Bonaventure, and St. Robert Bellarmine, now those are all doctors of the church, the least pain in purgatory is greater than the greatest pain on earth. The least pain in purgatory is greater than the greatest pain on earth. What's the pain of sense then? According to the teaching of St. Gregory the Great, St. Augustine, St. Cyprian, St. Basil, St. Robert Bellarmine, all doctors of the church, and according to the experience of many saints who visited purgatory, the pain of sense is caused by purgatorial fire. How long are souls detained in purgatory? The last great Thomistic theologian, Father Reginald Marie Garagou Lagrange taught, quote, Theological opinion in general favors long duration of purgatorial purification. Private revelations mention three or four centuries or even more, especially for those who have a high office and great responsibility. 
Close quote. That great doctor of the church, St. Robert Bellarmine, says, quote, There is no doubt that the pains of purgatory are not limited to 10 and 20 years, and they last, in some cases, entire centuries. Close quote. The reality is, we've got to pay now or pay later. Our Lord meant exactly what he said when he told us, we must deny ourselves, pick up our cross, and come and follow him. We don't want to be under any illusions. Everybody doesn't just go off skipping to heaven right when they die that's saved. I'm going to insert something here. I happen to know someone that's a victim of soul for priests. Now please do not ask for such a thing. Although some spiritual writers you read might indicate or seem to indicate that something can be asked for, properly speaking, something like that should only come from the heavenly side. To ask for a volunteer for extraordinary crosses without a heavenly invitation is a very great risk of committing the sin of presumption because you're assuming you can take a cross that God didn't ask you to. Okay, that being said, this person uh, is a victim self a priest. I was talking to her on the phone. It'll be three weeks ago tomorrow. When suddenly she was completely startled by something that happened and never happened before. The sudden appearance of a suffering woman that was dressed in clothing of roughly uh, World War I vintage. The woman's name was Emma. She gave every appearance of being the great-great-grandmother of the woman to whom she appeared and she wanted uh, a mass said for her soul. Now, before we go any farther, let us suppose the whole thing was an illusion. I don't, obviously. I wouldn't be talking about it. I was startled myself by the event. In any event, even if the apparition were an illusion, the worst that could happen in respecting such a request is the grace from that Mass would be applied to another poor soul in purgatory. So in any event, a poor soul was going to gain. So given that reality, I did the obvious thing. And several days later, I offered a Mass for repose of Emma's soul. Later in that day that I'd offered the Mass, I was speaking to the woman again, and I asked her to pray to Our Lady and ask that if it was pleasing to her, she might make it clear in some fashion if more Masses or suffrages of some sort need to be applied uh, to Emma or if there's anything else uh, th- that I should do in this case. Now, you'll notice I deliberately asked the woman to pray to Our Lady and not to Emma. Why? Because even though I was happy to offer a Mass uh, in such conditions, still you want to be very careful to observe every precaution in case it's some kind of a trick that you don't know about. I'm not the bishop of that place. I don't have a charismatic grace to determine these things, okay? So you can't go wrong praying to Our Lady, but since I'm not the bishop of that place, I can be wrong whether or not my judgment about an apparition is really from purgatory or not. But Our Lady's Our Lady. Praying to her, you can't go wrong. And here we're asking for guidance, by the way, and not some sort of special revelation. Typically, the, the kind of things that would happen is is indicated by a turn of events in our daily life. In a circumstance like this, somebody might come up and, and give you several stipends and say, Father, I want you to say a Mass for the soul that most needs it or that you most think needs it. Or you're reading a spiritual work and you turn the page and it starts talking about the importance of saying certain prayers or something like that. That's the sort of thing that typically heaven indicates. The last thing we've got to be absolutely certain about, and we can't be careful enough about this, is we must not ask for locutions or visions or anything extraordinary ever, ever, don't ever ask for that. That's really asking for trouble. And there is somebody that's going to be really happy to honor your request. He's right there. We've already talked about Jehenna. They're going to show up and you're going to have real problems. Do not ever ask for that kind of stuff. In heaven, we get to see. Until then, we live by faith. So anyway, I asked the woman to pray to Our Lady and ask her if it was pleasing to her. Might she make it clear in some fashion if some more master suffrages should be offered for Emma or if there's anything else she wanted me to do in this case. And so she paused for a while to pray. And no sooner did she start praying to Our Lady... Then Emma appeared to her again. And this time, she wasn't nearly as startled. Then Emma, as if she was answering the question on behalf of Our Lady, if there was anything else she wanted me to do in this case, turned sideways and gestured with her left hand. And as she did this, the woman suddenly saw a vast multitude of sickly-looking people, a vast multitude of souls on either side of Emma. And Emma said with outstretched arm, these are the forgotten souls that no one prays for anymore. These are the forgotten souls that no one prays for anymore. Let let that not be said of us. I asked about the composition of the crowd. She said there were vast numbers. The majority were children. I asked what that meant. Seemed to be about 8 to 16 years old. There's slightly more women than men in the adults. There are almost no priests or bishops. Now, why the scarce number of priests or bishops? 
It's perfectly consistent with traditional. Just cite uh, two doctors of the church. That great father and doctor of the church, St. John Chrysostom, comments, I do not speak rashly. I do not think that many priests are saved. But that those who perish are far more numerous. And speaking specifically of pastors and diocesan bishops, they're certainly pastors, they are the pastor of a diocese. St. John of Avila, another doctor of church, states, So many and so are great are the obligations of a pastor that he who fulfills only a third of them will be estimated by men to be a saint. But if he only content himself with that, he will not be able to escape Gehenna. We need to pray for our priests and our bishops. What a cruelty that so many people get canonized by their priests at the funeral. Imagine your funeral and being allowed to hear what the priest says. Now you're happy up in heaven, blah, 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 blah. That when we die, basically everybody loads up in that big Pete sailboat and sails off to heaven and they're just all happy. And there you are, sitting in purgatory, with the horrible realization that no one's going to pray for you. That you've been completely abandoned by the priest and your loved ones. That no one loves you enough to do anything for you. That in our enlightened age, you have virtually no hope of any help whatsoever from the church militant. These are the forgotten souls that no one prays for anymore. Now I want to be clear. This is in the realm of private revelation. You don't have to believe it. You don't have to believe any of what I just said. I'm not lying to you, but that doesn't mean it's a real revelation, okay? I believe it, and I believe with all my heart, or you wouldn't be hearing about it from the pulpit, that's for sure. I personally believe with all my heart, this is a direct answer from Our Lady to that prayer. By this, at least, Our Lady is asking me, or indicating me, I'm supposed to remind you to pray for the poor souls. To remember the poor souls in your masses, in your rosaries, your sacrifices, and your striving to get indulgences. But let's be clear. This is definitely in the realm, this story, of something at best we can only believe with human faith, and certainly not with the divine faith with which we must believe each and every teaching of the church. We've got to be really clear on that. In any event, believe it or not, however each one of us chooses to take this, each and every one of us can and should still take it as a very timely reminder of how urgent the need our brothers and sisters in purgatory have for our masses, prayers, sacrifices, and indulgences. Because they have been abandoned. They have been abandoned. That's Emma. There is a church suffering. Next level up, the limbo of the infants. These days, there's an absolutely massive amount of confusion about this in people's minds. The confusion was added to in 2007 when the International Theological Commission put out a document on it. It has no teaching authority. So we're not going to pay any attention uh, to that. Uh, instead, we're going to review the actual teaching of the church, and we'll rely in this part of the sermon largely on the brilliant work of Father Brian Harrison O.S., now, for many, the doctrine of limbo infants is a hard, painful truth. That's, that's for sure. But a truth, even a hard truth, is infinitely better than a soothing lie. The truth is what's going to set us free. So the first thing we need to do is put the limbo of the infants in its proper context. In order to do that, we need to remember that, thanks to Adam, we're all conceived and born in sin, excepting, of course, her. That's the whole problem. Adam chose sides in this war between the devil and heaven. On the behalf of all mankind, on behalf of men, as the father of men, he declared war against God. And the result, which particularly concerns us about that right now, is found in Ephesians, it's chapter 2, verse 3. By nature, we are born children of wrath. By nature, we're born children of wrath. It's not as if God owes us heaven. Everyone needs to burn that into his mind. God does not owe me heaven. This is something that for some reason a lot of people don't seem to clearly grasp. God does not owe me heaven. He loves me. He loves me so much he sent his only begotten son down to suffer and die for me so I could gain eternal life. But he doesn't owe me eternal life. What does that mean? It means that none of us can say to God, it's unfair if I didn't get to heaven. It's not unfair because he doesn't owe me heaven. And not only that, it also means we can't say to God, it's unfair that everyone doesn't get to heaven. 
We can't say that either. But Father, doesn't God desire the salvation of all men? Yes, He does, and it would be heretical to deny that. But in spite of that, we know that some men still go to hell, as we just heard. Pius II condemned the statement that all Christians are saved. So God wants all men to be saved, but certain conditions must be met. And one of these conditions is baptism, or at least the desire for baptism. And as we know, no one can desire baptism unless he has at least the use of reason. Let's quickly consider the teaching of the church with regard to baptism of babies. In regard to this matter, the great father, bishop, and doctor of the church, he's actually a doctor of grace. St. Augustine says, quote, Whoever says that infants are alive in Christ, even when they depart this life without being baptized, is really opposing both the apostolic preaching and condemning the whole church, which runs hastily with infants to the baptismal font, because it is believed without any doubt that otherwise the infants cannot possibly be alive in Christ. Close quote. The Holy Doctor also states, quote, If you want to be a Catholic, do not believe. Do not teach. Do not say, do not teach, that infants carried off by death before they are baptized can attain the remission of original sin. If you want to be a Catholic, do not believe, do not say, do not teach that infants carried off by death before they are baptized can attain the remission of original sin. That's St. Augustine. In 417, Pope Innocent I wrote to a bishop's synod, quote, The idea that infants can be granted the rewards of eternal life without even the grace of baptism is utterly foolish. Close quote, the victor of Christ. The Ecumenical Council of Florence 1442 states, quote, Regarding children, indeed, because of danger of death, which can often take place, since no help can be brought to them by another remedy than through the sacrament of baptism, through which they are snatched from the domination of the devil and adopted among the sons of God, the most holy Roman church advises that holy baptism ought not to be deferred for 40 or 80 days, but it should be conferred as soon as it can be done conveniently. Close quote. The Catechism of the Council of Trent states, quote, Baptism is necessary for the salvation of all, that this law is to be understood not only of adults, but also of infants, and that the Church has received this from apostolic tradition as confirmed by the concurrent doctrine and authority of the Fathers. Close quote. In 1951, Pope Pius XII stated, quote, The newly born child receives supernatural life with baptism. In the present economy of grace, there is no other way to communicate that life to the child who has not attained the use of reason. Above all, the state of grace is absolutely necessary at the moment of death. Without its salvation and supernatural happiness, the beatific vision of God are impossible. Close quote, the victor of Christ. In the instruction on infant baptism issued in 1980 by the Second Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith and approved by Pope St. John Paul II, we read, quote, The Church has shown by her teaching and practice that she knows no other way, apart from baptism, for ensuring children's enter, entry into eternal happiness. Close quote. Okay, so the point here is that for a baby to be freed from original sin, for a baby to be alive in Christ, for a baby to be in the state of grace, he must be baptized. Now that being said, unless they're dying, do not baptize your little heathen grandchildren. If they're not going to be raised as good Catholics, the last thing you want to do is baptize them unless they're dying because the probability of them apostatizing at the age of region is huge. Do not do that to them. Okay then. Obviously, since a baby can't sin, if he is in the state of grace, if he's been baptized and when he dies, he goes straight to heaven. He can't go to purgatory because he can't sin. So what happens to a baby that's not in the state of grace when he dies? In other words, what happens to unbaptized babies who die? They go to the limbo of the infants. I'll start by just using some of the quotes here. What do the scholastics teach? The scholastic theologians teach about the limbo of the infants. Remember, as we've seen before, that if the scholastic theologians all teach that something is of the Catholic faith, their testimony is absolutely reliable and has to be reckoned in the same way as that of the church fathers. The scholastic theologians are unanimous in teaching that all those unbaptized people who die never having reached the age of reason. So they might not be a baby, it might be somebody that's profoundly uh, mentally handicapped, or something, but all those unbaptized people who die never having reached the age of reason, all those who die with only original sin on their soul, go to the limbo of the infants. 
In other words, it exists, and in spite of current confusion, its existence cannot be questioned. That's the scholastics. On three separate occasions, the church has made an infallible statement regarding this very question. First occasion, in 1264, the Second Ecumenical Council of Lyon. Second occasion, in 1321, Pope John XXII in his epistle to Arminians. And third occasion, 1439, the Ecumenical Council of Florence. What was stated on those three occasions? The Second Council of Lyon, Pope John XXII, and the Council of Florence each stated infallibly that the souls of those who die in mortal sin, or those who die in original sin only, Original sin only are infants or those who have never reached the age of reason. The souls of those who die in mortal sin are souls who die in original sin only descend immediately into hell, but to undergo different penalties. The souls of those who die in mortal sin and the souls of those who die in original sin only descend immediately into the underworld, but to undergo different penalties. Because in this sense, the word hell is used in that old-fashioned one and not in the sense of Gehenna completely. Okay? I'll go through that then. What does that mean? As the great cardinal doctor church, St. Robert Bellman explains, it means that the souls of the damned plunge into the very depths of the fires of hell. Those are the ones that die in mortal sin. But the souls of unbaptized babies go to the fringe of hell, a place where the flames do not reach and the babies do not have the beatific vision, which is nonetheless a place of perfect and perpetual natural happiness. They go to the fringe of hell. That's why it's called limbo. What is the situation of those babies in limbo? St. Thomas explains that the limbo of the children is the place where the souls of children who die before reaching the age of reason, without being baptized, reside. Because they died without grace, they lack the beatific vision. But it's a place of perpetual and perfect happiness at the level of nature. It's a place of perpetual and perfect natural happiness. Now, Blessed Dun Scotus says that infants in limbo, quote, have a natural knowledge of all naturally knowable things more excellently than any philosophers have had in this state, and thus they can attain to a certain natural beatitude in God in knowing his general attributes. Close quote. What about aborted babies? Does that mean they go to limbo? Yes, it does. In 1588, Pope Sixtus V addressed this question in his constitution Ephronatum. The Pope commanded that anyone in the Papal States, now until 1870, the Papal States were an area in what's now sent, what we call Central Italy, but it's an area that the Popes ruled. They were the secular rulers. Now, Pope Sixtus V commanded that anyone in the Papal States who carried out abortions and sterilizations should be put to death. That's the Pope, the Vicar of Christ himself, commanding the death penalty for these heinous criminals. Now, don't be surprised. Uh, if, unless my memory is, is faulty, the Vatican had the death penalty till 1969. Anyway, it's not against church teaching, but that's a topic for a different day. So anyway, Sixtus V strikes out against, quote, the barbarity of those who do not shrink from the most cruel slaughter of fetuses still coming to maturity in the shelter of their mother's wombs. Who indeed would not detest a crime as horrific as this? For its certain outcome is that not just bodies, but still worse, even souls are wantonly sacrificed. The soul of the unborn infant bears the imprint of God's image. It is a soul for whose redemption Christ our Lord shed his precious blood. A soul capable of eternal blessedness and destined for the company of angels. Who therefore would not condemn and punish with the utmost severity the desecration committed by one who has excluded such a soul from the blessed vision of God. Such a person is as responsible as a human being can be for preventing the soul's attainment of the throne prepared for it in heaven and has deprived God of the service of his own creature. Close quote, Pope Sixtus V, the vicar of Christ. What did the vicar of Christ tell us over and over in this quote? It's a hard truth, but we have to face up to it. The Holy Father states that abortionists have excluded souls from the beatific vision. That abortionists prevent the souls of aborted babies from getting to the throne God had prepared for them in heaven. In other words, they went to limbo. The fact that unbaptized babies that die go to limbo is traditional Catholic doctrine. Until our crazy times, the only discussion about this was not where the babies were. There's a unanimous and infallible uh, consent in that. The only discussion was during the time of the fathers, because some of the fathers thought that because they died with original sin, they might have to undergo some mild suffering. That's been the only theological discussion about it till our times. Not where they are, but whether they suffered. And the scholastics were, it's theologically certain that they're happy. But that's something that that's the scholastics, we can thank the scholastic theologians from sorting out some of that stuff. Because only a few of the fathers. Okay, so let's sum this up. 
On the one hand, the traditional Catholic doctrine that come to us from apostolic times have been consistently taught by the fathers, the doctors, the scholastic theologians, the popes, and the councils that babies who die without baptism will never have the beatific vision. Now, on the other hand, we have modern theologians claiming that we can now have hope beyond hope that babies who die without baptism will have the beatific vision. They're complete contradictory positions. It actually matters. Consider the implications here. If since apostolic times the church has been wrong on the absolute necessity of baptism for the salvation of babies, if the church has been wrong since the very beginning on a very fundamental and essential truth, then what else is the church wrong on? Unbaptized babies, if they die, go to limbo of the infants. Now before we go to the last level, it's worth noting, it's worth reflecting on, that in our day and age, a vast number of people, both priests and faithful, have somehow got themselves in a position to think that no one is any in, in any of these three levels of the underworld. We don't have anyone in hell, we don't have anyone in purgatory, and we don't have anyone in limbo. It's a very strange time. Next level up, top story in the underworld, the limbo of the fathers. Now, this level of hell, the level of the underworld, quickly review. Since the sin of Adam, since original sin, heaven is closed to man, no souls of man are in heaven. At that point, as soon as a man died, his soul descended into hell. If he died in one sin, even one mortal sin, it was all the way into Gehenna. He's damned for all eternity, what we now call hell. If he died in the state of grace, in other words, with absolutely no unforgiven, or in the state of grace, in other words, with no uh, mortal sins on his soul whatsoever, Whatsoever, but he, he still had to make reparation for his sin and lack of virtue. He went to purgatory. If he died with original sin on his soul, it was a baby that hadn't been cleansed from original sin. In the Old Covenant, for example, without getting into all the details, but that's when it, for boys, circumcision, that's what, what uh, released them from original sin. A girl just had to be offered up. And anyway, if he died with original sin on his soul, it was exactly the same. He went to the limbo of the baby. So it's all the same. Those three levels. If you're, you die in mortal sin, you'd go to hell then, you do now. If you died with reparation due, you go into purgatory just like now. If you died with original sin only, you went to limbo. All the same. Okay? What's different? In the back in the old days, so all that's all the same. What's different back then is if a man died in the state of grace with no reparation to make, or if he finished his time in purgatory, then he went to the limbo of the fathers. Nowadays, such a man would go straight to heaven. But in those days, thank to, uh, thanks to Adam, heaven shut. The limbo of the fathers is where St. Joseph was. Moses, Noah, Saints Joachim and Anne, St. Adam and Eve, all the saints of the Old Testament are detained. That's the best anyone could hope for back in those days. So why on Good Friday would the soul of Christ our Lord descend to hell? This is the question we posed quite a few minutes ago. St. Thomas gives three reasons. Just as it was fitting for Christ to die in order to deliver us from death, it was fitting for him to descend to hell to deliver us from going down into hell. See, nowadays, if we die without reparation, we don't have to go there. Secondly, because when the Passion, he broke the devil's power in the Passion, he also went into the world to release the captives that had been held there since the devil tricked or got Adam to commit the original sin. So he's, he's snatching the captives out of the hand of the devil. And third, uh, that he showed his power on earth by living and dying, he might show it in, in the underworld by visiting and enlightening it. Okay? So as it said, as it said in Philippians 2.10, At the name of Jesus, every knee should bend, not only of them that are in heaven, but likewise of them that are in hell. That's St. Thomas. He explains further. When Christ descended to hell, he delivered the saints who were there, not by leading them out at once from the confines of hell, but by enlightening them with the glory, light of glory in hell itself. Nevertheless, it was fitting that his soul should abide in hell as long as his body remained in the tomb. So our Lord stayed in limbo of the fathers until Easter Sunday when he rose from the dead. And at that time, he brought the souls that had been in the limbo of the fathers up out of the underworld. So on Easter Sunday, the limbo, limbo of the fathers was empty for good. Okay. What about the good thief? As we really read in Luke chapter 23, verse 43, while our Lord's hanging on the cross, that he says to the good thief, Thou shalt be with me this day in paradise. If he went down to limbo of the fathers that day, how could he say, Thou shalt be with me this day in paradise? St. Thomas answers it. Our Lord's expression does not refer to the earthly paradise, the Garden of Eden, but to the spiritual paradise, which everyone who enjoys the divine glory all said to be. And so even though the soul of the thief descended into hell with Christ, still he enjoyed the rewards of paradise because he enjoyed the divinity of Christ just as the other saints did. In other words, during our Lord's time in the limbo of the fathers, it was indeed a spiritual paradise because all the souls there were gazing on his glory. So it was, it was emptied out on Easter Sunday when Christ our Lord, who had descended down there, brought all the souls up to the surface of the earth. The ascension. 
Last thing. By this time, it ought to be easy to understand the significance of the ascension. Once we understand what's going on in the underworld, now ascension is easy to understand. The ascension puts the seal on our Lord's work of salvation. Since original sin, heaven had been completely and utterly closed to mankind. There's no men, only angels. That's why in the worship of God in the Old Covenant, in the tabernacle or the temple, the only statues were statues of angels of the mercy seat. I heard you singing about that on, on the processional. Or, uh, on, so the only things were statues of angels on the mercy seat, and on the veil they're embroidered angels because that's all there was in heaven. There weren't, you know, you had God and the angels. So now, because we have the ascension, we have souls of men in heaven. So we have statues in, in, of, of men, not just angels. We, you have angels a lot of time in statues, but now we have men too. Okay, so why 40 days? Just as Moses spent 40 days with God on Mount Sinai receiving the new law, so now St. Peter sends 40 days with Christ our Lord, largely on Mount Sinai receiving the new law of the gospel. Another reason he wants to show how loving and generous he is in his consolations. His apostles and disciples had suffered for desolation for 40 hours when he laid in the tomb. Now for every hour that they had desolation, he gives them a day of consolation. 40 hours in the tomb, 40 days of consolation. How much more can we expect, God willing, we all get to heaven? Where was he during these 40 days? According to St. Justin Martyr, St. Irenaeus, St. Bonaventure, and St. Thomas, besides spending time with apostles, Christ spent some of the time with Enoch and Elijah, since they have to remain to fight against the Antichrist and be martyred at the end of the world. How did our Lord ascend? By his own power. He's God. What sort of blessing did our Lord give before he ascended? St. Basil the Great says it's an apostolic tradition that the Lord blessed them with the sign of the cross just before he ascended. Where is he right now? He's seated at the right hand of the Father. Now because we're speaking of something spiritual, God the Father doesn't have a body, so obviously he doesn't have hands. This is a figure of speech, which signifies, as St. Thomas says, quote, Christ is said to sit at the right hand of the Father inasmuch as he reigns together with the Father and has judicial power for him, just as he who sits at the king's right hand helps him in ruling and judging, close quote. And as that great doctor of the church, St. John Damascene says, we do not speak of the Father's right hand as of a place, for how can a place be designated by his right hand who himself is beyond all place? By the Father's right hand we refer to the glory Glory and honor of the Godhead. So our Lord is seated at the right hand of the Father until he comes in judgment on the clouds of glory at the end of the world. And of course, he's really, truly present. Body, blood, soul, and divinity in all the tabernacles of the world. Okay, so hopefully now everybody has a lot clearer idea of what we mean when we say he descended to hell and he ascended into heaven. Let's close with a thought from the great father and doctor church, Pope St. Leo the Great. Quote, In the person of Christ, we have penetrated the heights of heaven. Christ's ascension is our own ascension. Our body has the hope of one day being where its glorious head has proceeded.